Miss Tranner is this fabled city of song. The problem is that things keep happening to it. Hi, this is Ivan of Many Realms, and on this episode of Realms War, we're talking all about Myth Draner, or as I said, Myth Drainer, when I was pitching this idea to Ed. <laughs> Mr. Greenwood, ever gracious, reminded me that it's probably pronounced that way somewhere in the realms, right? So uh, go ahead and keep that one in your back pocket next time you can't remember how to pronounce something. <sighs> Myth Draner, also known as Cormanthor, or the City of Bards, the City of Beauty, the City of Brotherhood, the City of Crowns, the City of Love, the City of Might, the City of Songs, the City of Spells... The Let's just say it has a lot of names, okay? <laughs> Known by many as a popular adventuring site where you can go and search for long hidden treasure, all while fending off demons and fiends and devils. But I don't want to spoil too much because Ed has so much incredible stuff to say about it. But before we jump into it, I would also like to remind you to go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood where you can find the extended version of this conversation as well as all of our other conversations, usually clocking in at <laughs> like twice as long as well as weekly realms lore drops, polls, live Q&As, behind the scenes, and much, much more. All right, now on to the good stuff. Miss Draner is the fabled city of song. It's, it's a beautiful soaring city of the elves in the middle of Cormansor, um, the elven court, as um, many humans call that woods today, which is sort of east of Shadowdale and Mistledale, um, in the middle of the forest. And in the past, this particular city was unusual in that the elves who lived there invited in all of the sentient races who were inclined to get along with others. So not orcs, not drow, but Elves, dwarves, gnomes, halflings, etc. Um, and they could all live together in Mistranor. They could all trade together in Mistranor. And uh, not all elves were happy about this. And so there were some um, arch conservatives amongst them, like the Starum noble family um, of elves, um, who appear in Elminster and Mistranor because. Uh, the sequel to Elminster, The Making of a Mage, is Elminster and Myth Tranor. He literally walks out of the end of one book and into the next. That's the 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 only two novels in the early um, Elminster books that there's no time break between them. It's Bing B. And Elminster comes into Myth Tranor and is not welcomed by many of the elves who regard him as an upstart. And the Coronal, the Coronal Eltergrim, who is the ruler of Miss Tranor at the time, is facing some pushback from a lot of the more conservative elves about letting in um, idiots, upstarts, <laughs> um, a non-people. Yeah. You know, it's good old racism is rearing its head, but it's elves against humans. And Elminster is a, your viewpoint character. You're looking over his shoulder, and he, as he his magic abilities are recognized by the Srinshi, who is really powerful, um, and she, he becomes her student. And, you know, the Srinshi is not stupid. The Srinshi can smell Mistra all over Elminster, but, but we get to see the qualities of the elves bickering over this, and they are very human qualities, and that was my point, that elves... Um, exhibited the same arrogance, decadence, um, privilege um, that many humans did, and that these were universal qualities, not necessarily human qualities. And that was one of the things I wanted to explore, what it was really like to be another race uh, in a setting that had other races, as opposed to what we used to call when I was a kid a Star Trek alien. Meaning, you took an actor, you had no budget. This is in early days when they didn't have um, computer-generated graphics. The special effects were all makeup. So what you did was stick weird ears on a human actor, <laughs> um, dye their skin some weird color, yeah. and tell them to do something unusual, like touch their nose every five seconds, or go, meet, 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 in between each sentence, or whatever. 
and that was your alien. And because of the constraints of a short television episode, you didn't have time to generate their back story and culture unless it was germane to the plot of the episode. Like we go into, we all go into sleep, or we, we have children by budding, or whatever it is. So it was up to the fans and novelizations and so on to develop, develop the lore. Well, I was trying to do the same thing for the realms, bring us past. Um, they look, they're humans, but they look funny. Humans with funny ears into, no, they are different and in, in these ways. And of course, for elves, the main way is they play the long game. Human lifetimes are short to them. And humans are very hasty to use, to borrow tree birds, tree beard, the ants, um, vocabulary from Lord of the Rings. Um, all these people do things very quickly, rashly, um, without care for the consequences. They don't take time to do anything properly. They just do it. And of course, from the point of view of any of those other races, they don't have time to do anything else. We've only got our four score years and 10, if we're lucky. And most of us in a fantasy novel aren't that lucky because we get killed by somebody <laughs> with a sword or a tentacle at, in chapter three. Um, so <laughs> Myth Dranor was this wonderful crossroad city where people could cross pollinate and be cultured. And of course, even some of the conservative elves were thinking, good. I mean, I don't like this policy, but being as we have this policy, it allows us to get things from the far corners of the world more easily without going there ourselves. We can get all of these weird, funny people we're letting in to bring the stuff with them, and we'll buy it from them, number one. And number two, it's a chance for our culture, the right way to do things, right. the civilized sure, way to do sure. things, um, to rub off on all these unwashed um, visitors who aren't elves. Um, so maybe they will grow up and learn to behave and all this. You know, see, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm lampooning yeah, it as yeah. I say it, but I mean, that, and that's what sort of what I was looking at, but it has to be looked at around the action in the novel. So, uh, that's what I was doing. So Miss Tranner is this fabled city of song. The problem is that things keep happening to it. And for most of the uh, 1300s, Dale Reckoning, in the Forgotten Realms, in other words, the Forgotten Realms, as you saw it in 2nd, 3rd edition, 3.5, um, Mist Tranor was a ruin. And it was a ruin that was very dangerous to explore. I mean, it was a fabled ruin. Everybody knew, in quotation marks, there were elven treasures everywhere, not just gold and gems, but magic galore. But if you went there, you died. And there, and you can see that, Miss Dranner, in Spellfire. You can see uh, the my novel, Spellfire, not the card game Spellfire, um, which Jim Ward took the name of my novel and said, that's a really cool name. We're going to have to use it for something better than a really? novel. So, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, don't worry. Um, t the early TSR had a history of reusing names. Oh, boy. So there are quite often products that get f confused with other products like Lords of Darkness because you reuse the title. Anyway, leaving that aside, another Ed's digression, um, uh, but you also saw it in the box set, Ruins of Myth Dranor. And the whole point of this was uh, it was not safe to go there because many gates had opened so that what you actually saw, although it got truncated severely in the editing, because my novel Spellfire was originally three times as long, Oof. and it got it got cut by two thirds, which is why Dark Horrors vanished out of the text. Darken beasts, as they became. Uh, anyway, um, again, leaving aside that digression, um, what it meant was there were gates to both the abyss, where demons come from, and the nine hells, where devils come from, um, all over the city of Mithrater. So if you went there as an adventurer, you probably got killed and eaten or torn apart or whatever by a demon or a devil. And if you fought that demon or devil, it promptly summoned others through the gate. Right, and right. And you were fighting more of them. And so 
what it really was was a can I run fast enough to escape with my life? Which is why Mr. Anner still had all of its stuff, all of its treasure. Nobody got any of it. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, um, the whole point of the Knights of Mr. Anner and all of that going on and some of the gates being closed is that once word gets around about that and the demons and devils that are left are on their own, you still have to fight them, but they can't summon legions of their chums, um, then it becomes a gold rush for adventurers. Hey, let's go to the city of Mithran. Are we going to be rich beyond the dreams of avarice? How would you <laughs> like to be a king? We'll buy our own kingdom. And so they all went rushing in there. And then they were fighting each other and slaughtering right. each other. And then finally, Sembia wants to move in because there's not a thing. And Hillsfire wants to move in. And the Centrum <laughs> want to, to get me. So again, it's a gold rush. Um, but yeah, that's Mr. Anner in a nutshell. Um, the problem is it keeps being rebuilt and opened and becoming a shining new hope and then trashed again. There's your introduction to Miss Tranner. <laughs> I know it's a pretty morbid one, too. Well, it's like, okay. this place is great when it's still standing. It's really great. Yeah. <laughs> so, Miss Tranner today. If your campaign is in the late 1490s DR, and by now, official realms date, in the published Watsy Canon products, is flirting with... 1,500 to DR. You know, we're right on the doorstep. The cusp. Yeah, the cusp, yeah. Um. So, if you went to Mithrander today, after the events of the Herald, you will find it in ruins. And you'll find elves, and half-elves, and the occasional dwarf, no more halfling, busily rebuilding the place. And at this stage, they're mostly doing plumbing, sewage, and the foundations of just plain dwellings. So far. That's where they are so far. The soaring towers and the grandly paved avenues will come later. Now, Baelnorn still guard the tombs, and there are small, marked with ribbons. So, think of police line tape in the modern world. There are small marked with ribbons by, because there's still tons of trees around. They were in the middle of a beautiful forest. Now, bits of it got trashed in the fighting, but there's still standing dead trees here and there, and the, they're planting new ones, and the forest reclaims things fast, in part because of Elwyn magic. So there are trees everywhere, so you can put ribbons on these trees, and they use them to mark off well magic areas as a result of all the fighting that they just want to warn you to steer clear of if you don't want to be horribly transformed. Um, just stay out of that grove of trees there, sort of thing. So that's what Miss Tranner looks like now, this instant. I do want to just touch on the fact of what these, uh, I guess, how these portals came to be, right? For folks that might not know um, anything at all about Miss Tranner, why these portals were so significant, uh, why people adventuring to Mr. Anner wouldn't be fighting devils in the first place, um, and how that kind of situation arose. Mm. It's complicated, <laughs> is the short answer. No, no way, really? Oh, okay, okay. So let's go back to the name Miss, Miss Tranner. It's not the only one. There's Miss Nantar, Miss Rin, Miss, you know, okay. Miss is a way the elves named cities that had a mythal. And elves came up with mythals, and separately the ancient netheries, uh, Iulam of the ancient netheries, concocted the first mythalar. Now, what these basically are is permanent or semi-permanent, as in, unless or until they collapse or aren't maintained, they will continue indefinitely. Giant ward spells. Um, and the giant ward spells aren't just to keep things out. They govern conditions within them. So, for instance, just as an example, you could create a city um, north of the spine of the world where Ten Towns is, and everybody else is shivering, and it's icy, and inside your mythal, it's hot, and everybody's strolling around in their bare nakeds because it's like a sauna. 
and you're growing tropical hothouse fruit and eating them off the vine, and you're looking out through the clear um, force fields, if you want to call it that, of the mythal going, oh, look at that howling blizzard out there. Good thing we aren't out there. <laughs> uh, because inside your mythal, you could put all the conditions you wanted in your mythal. Uh, you could have anti-gravity so people could dance in midair in places. Yeah, but in general, you can do things in the mythal, and, and the most basic way is to control the climate. So if you don't want to be rained on in the middle of your wedding or funeral or bar mitzvah, whatever, uh, you don't want to be uh, rained on. You just make sure that all the rain falling will hit the mythal and stream down its sides. And everybody could do their own. It's like, how do you play D&D? &D? You know, what style do you use? I mean, the missile could be as an individual as the people who spun them. But Miss Dranner had a missile, and part of the things that they wanted to do as this city grew more and more important was to be able to uh, travel quickly, make it a hub. And therefore, um, more and more gates, as I called them, because that's what they were called in that edition of the game. Check out my classic... Uh, Dragon 37 article, Gates, D&D, &D, <laughs> uh, from the city of Brass to Dead Orc Pass in one small step. The new theory of Gates and D&D, da-da-da, which is the article that got me a, a contributing editorship because Kim Mohan was really impressed because it was the first article that had ever been submitted that had footnotes. <laughs> awesome so, so that was number 37 for the collectors yeah. out there like myself I'm going to go probably 37. get an episode or an episode an, art, uh, an issue of 37 issue 37 of The Dragon as it was then so they, they, they were gates in that part in that era of the game they got renamed much later in later eras as portals but they're the same thing extra dimensional things and some of them in Mithranor we had people um getting more and more arrogant, more and more powerful, getting more and more like the ancient Netherese Arcanists, and they're biting off more than they can chew. They're, they're oh, I can handle anything. So I can open a, um, a portal, a planar portal, to the Nine Hells and start pulling in devils to work for me, because I want devils to build this, because I don't want to use my fellow Mithranans, because then people will know what I'm up to. I want this to be secret until I reveal it grandly. Uh, and I don't want to do the work myself because, oh, um, I don't stoop that low. <laughs> so I'll use devils, you know, somebody else is using demons. And of course, what happens if they get out of your control? Well, you start to lose parts of the city because they are going, ha, 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 ha. And, and it's like a buffet laid out for them. <laughs> yeah, that's what made it so dangerous for so long. And that's also what made it non-plundered for so long. It was too dangerous to pull things out of it, like gems and so on. Um, gold, magic, because um, you you couldn't get to them and get back out alive. So they stuck, stuck around for centuries, so therefore they were still there to be plundered. Uh, always something that a dungeon master should ask himself. Always something that a fiction writer working on fantasy should ask themselves. If there's a huge honking treasure sitting here for my characters in my story right now to plunder, why is it still here? <laughs> why didn't somebody take it last week or last month? Yep. You know, yep. why is it here? There must be a good reason. If you can come up with a good reason, that's fine. So I think we're at that part of the episode, Ed, where I where I ask you the uh, the the generic but all important question: What is the one thing you wish more people knew about Myth Dranner? Maybe something secret, maybe something not oft discussed, or maybe something that was cut out of a novel or a graphic novel or uh, an episode of or an issue of the Dragon or or what have you. But uh, the one thing that you wish more people knew and you think all Dungeon Masters should know about Myth Dranner? Oh, I don't know about one thing. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, in the original Realms box set, there was an adventure in there, and there was a little mini dungeon. And I'm going to spoil it for everybody. Um, it contains a gate in that dungeon, which will take you to Undermountain, halfway across the realms. Um, so the thing to remember is there are tons and tons and tons of mini dungeons 
under Miss Tranner. Little, um... I suppose the way to th um, think of it would be we have this beautiful mansion and we want to expand. We can't expand because there's a beautiful mansion next door that doesn't belong to us. Oh, but we can go down. So we'll just expand our cellars and we'll put in a swimming pool down there and we'll put in everything we want. So there are lots of little cellars that have been sealed off for years because the building on top of them has collapsed down onto them, sealing them in. Who knows what's down there? There's also something I can tell you that's definitely down in a lot of them, and also in places where there are no dungeons like this. Dungeons in quotation marks. There are no cellar complexes. And that is the fact that many people in Mistranor developed a spell that has never been put into the game, so you're hearing it here first. It's a force finger spell, and what it does is it gnaws through solid stone and stone-like mixes, inorganic mixes, like concrete. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, this for force finger spell can burn a hole wherever you're pointing, so you, you point with a finger, and it burns a little cylinder or shaft through the solid stone for a certain distance and then stops. If you have to hide something in a hurry because you're being attacked or you have to go away or you don't want to, you have to go out and you don't want to lose something valuable. And if that something is a wand or a ring, magical, I mean, you use your force finger spell, you burn your little hole in the ground you drop your wand down the hole once it's cooled. Then you kick and scratch all the rubble you can find around it down the hole on top of it. And if there's a dead mouse or rat around, you drop them in too. And then nobody ever, you hope, comes back and finds it because nobody else knows it's there except you. But if you never come back, because you get killed horribly three minutes later, um... Then there are all these little hidey holes of rings and wands and everything are still there. And because Mistranor was this inventive city of magic, you can be darn sure that a lot of those wands and rings aren't straight out of the Dungeon Master's Guide. They're almost like artifacts in that they have six or seven different little powers. Not world-shaking powers, but they do six or seven little different things. Not one thing. So if you find one of them, your career may be made. You pocket the stuff, you turn it to gold, and you leave town. And you do it again. I mean, oh, whatever. Again, uh, that, that is implying that you're, you have no ethics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. Be sure to hit the like button and leave us a comment and let us know how we did. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this and hit the bell icon if you want to get alerted every time you release new content. And if you want to show your support to Ed another way, why not head on over to edgreenwood.net slash shop where you can see our entire catalog of merch, including this super cool t-shirt that I happen to be wearing right now, this one that also just dropped, and tons more rad stuff. I'd also like to extend a huge thank you to all of the patrons that make this possible, because without you, we genuinely could not make these videos. If you're not a patron yet, but you're interested in becoming one, be sure to head on over to patreon.com slash edgreenwood, where you can find extended versions of these conversations, tons of exclusive realms lore, and much, much more. And last but not least, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our sponsor RPG Match, as well as our biggest supporters, our Legends of the Realms. Francisco Cabral, South Hill Sages, Stephen Snow, Martin Berlanda, John Foster, Gerald Brady, Alex Erie, Hunter Weber, Michael Scattergood, Jeremy E. Grenemeyer, Robert McDonnell, Fire Wraith, Melody Sigers, Gustavo Tortado, Puffles, Brian Kloitzel, and RPG Match. I mean, okay, so I, I feel like we can't move on until I at least address this. The two-thirds that got cut from Spellfire... First off, do they still exist? And second off, will we ever see those someday in some iteration? Spellfire is BC. 
before computers. Um, literally, uh, because my, my advance payment for the novel was to receive a computer so I could write on computer from then on for TSR. The computer was a Mac 2. It arrived broken, smashed in the mail, and it arrived a year after the novel deadline. So, 